Welcome back, everybody, uh, to our second plenary. I hope you enjoyed your concurrent sessions this afternoon. Um, this afternoon, we're ending with our second plenary, which I'm very delighted and, and happy to introduce. Um, and we took the privilege of taking a minute or two to just allow everybody to get, find their way back from the concurrence. So welcome. And I'd like to introduce now Dr. Tom Cooper and Dr. Aaron Oldford from the Faculty of Business Administration. And they're going to, uh, with their panelists this afternoon, talk about their innovative teaching and how it inspires learning. Take it away, Dr. Tom. Good afternoon, everyone. The business school, right? You know, control the stage, you know, dominance, all that sort of thing. Uh, welcome to our session where we're gonna be talking about uh, navigating new front frontiers, immersive and innovative practices in business school education. Uh, most of my life is based around just-in-time delivery, i.e. I got the slides done earlier today and I was asking the panelists, would you like to come onto the panel last night? So I'm very pleased to announce the panel, which is one of my awesome MBA students, Emmanuel. Emmanuel, what's, how do I pronounce your last name? I always get it wrong. See, I go on a but you know, it's a struggle for there. I just call him Emmanuel. He's no, my number one Emmanuel right now. I have my colleague, Dr. Jillian Morsey, who's the manager for the Center for Social Enterprise at the Faculty of Business Administration. I have my incredible uh, soon to be departed colleague, not from death, but leaving one, to be the new <laughs> dean at the University of Virginia in the Faculty of Business Administration there, uh, Dr. Aaron Olford and uh, the amazing Russell Noseworthy, who's not only uh, gonna be talking about the fun, but is also my son's basketball coach, and he has a practice at four o'clock, so we will make sure that we're finished. <laughs> so it's good from there, awesome. Um, today, we're going to go through a number of different things, and if we allow, we even have an interactive exercise just to show what I'm going to, some of the things that we do in terms of immersive and innovative teaching in the Faculty Business Administration. But we're gonna talk a little bit about inspired learning as, as a paradigm and why almost in the Faculty of Business Administration and in business schools in general, we have to be thinking about how do we be more immersive, how do we be ins more inspirational, how do we get students engaged to be not only from, I remember once reading a promotion file um, and reviewing it and this, the person I always said, I'm gonna steal this from now on, is one of the problems that we have in business schools is that we got, part of it, it's is obviously the theoretical and the, the good stuff, and we, we steal from every discipline, so we're using biology, we're using sociology, uh, there's all that kind of element. And then on the other side, uh, we actually have to prepare students to be uh, relevant for the business world as well. And so that dichotomy sometimes causes some issues in terms of how we, how we teach, how we uh, create courses, and all those sort of things as well. So I'll talk about a little about that. Then the major reason that we're here, we're gonna talk about three uh, things that we do at the Faculty of Business Administration in terms of um, innovative and immersive uh, learning. Uh, one of the things is really unique, which is the fund, which gets number one billing, and uh, Aaron and Russ are gonna be talking through that, and that's a really cool initiative that we've been doing for seven years now, six years, yeah, and it's gonna be super, super cool. Uh, next, we'll talk about the Living Lab, which is uh, run through the Center for Social Enterprise, and we've been doing that for five years now, and uh, Emmanuel, who was working on a project, and Jillian, who manages that and runs that, will talk about that as well. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about our undergraduate and MBA consulting, which we've been doing for over 10, 12 years with a whole bunch of really interesting organizations. Once we get through there, I'm gonna see what the time is like. If we've spent too, too long talking, which is normal, we may have to uh, jump over the exercise, uh, but if not, we have, a, we have an interactive exercise because I've been in these plenary sessions and eventually you get bored listening to me speak. So I'm gonna get you folks to actually work through something and we'll see how it goes. And then we'll have um, kind of rounded up with some questions and issues merging. Sound like a plan? Everybody happy? How much coffee did you get? See, this is the key, drinking coffee at three o'clock in the afternoon, right? No, I know. So no, you know, there you go, then you don't wake up. So. What we're seeing, and it's interesting for me in a post-pandemic world, looking at how different ways that we can uh, teach. And to the point where students now almost, uh, especially if, if they're coming in as graduate students, they're used to being on Zoom calls a lot. They're used to being in, um, 
and Teams and all those other horrible platforms. And a lot of times they're struggling to get into the classroom or alternatively, they have different expectations about showing up to class, et cetera. Uh, moreover, as I always like to say, um, there's a lot of amazing lecturers in the world and courses and you can buy them online for about 12 bucks um, online. So why should students come to class? Why should they be interested? How do we actually think about in terms of from a higher education and especially in a business school world where most university business schools were charging up a premium uh, tuition to actually go to that, go, uh, go to school. How do we make sure it's valuable? How do we make sure the students walk out and say, this has helped me? And then thirdly, in terms of how do we make it fun? And so that's one of the things that we're gonna talk about as well. And moreover, for us as academics and as uh, professors who are going up the tenure track um, slippery pole, um, how do we actually make sure that we're renew, uh, rewarded and we can actually demonstrate capacity because obviously with the publisher or parish paradigm that we all struggle under, how do we make sure that our, what we're doing from a teaching perspective is going to be valuable? And because it's really easy, to go, the, desk, uh, the book publishers are great, they'll give us a whole bunch of PowerPoint slides and off we go, we can talk about it. But honestly, you know, uh, if, and I assume for most of you who are here, that's not your jam. Uh, but if you're a hardcore researcher and you want to try to maximize every minute of your uh, day, doing research, that may be your jam. So what's the thing, jam is one of those innovative things like with the kids, we're talking about kids slang these days. So I got two teenagers, I used to, I, I speak too much slang with them. But anyway, the, the notion of how do we provide value, what are the things that we can do? And so what I've seen and what we'll be talking about with these three programs is in terms of what are some of the new skills and what are some of the new things that we need to have and secondly, that we need to impart upon our students. And business school academics also, in terms of we, we also have to think about, is this gonna work? Because if you're engaging with the outside community, which is basically all three of these activities, there's risks because it can go badly wrong. It can go badly wrong for the students as well. And so how do we start to think about those risks? What do we think about, there's all, we can talk about the rewards all day, but also how do we think about the downside risks and what are the things that we need to consider from there as well? And also in just in terms of how do we justify this for our, uh, for our administrators, for our colleagues to say this is really valuable and this is something we should be doing. So f I, I'm, a, I'm one of the believers and I always do this in all my courses regardless, I always love definitions. So, I, so when I talk about innovation in education it involves the development or adoption of ideas to improve policies, programs, practices, or personnel in terms of how we do teaching and it aims to create transformative opportunities within higher education. And then when I look at it in terms of what are the things we need to worry about is that not all innovations are good things. So sometimes you innovate, sometimes you do something immersive, and we'll, I can talk a little bit about some of the things that we've experienced um, over the last, at least in my experience, at money for the last 17 years. And also innovations must be impactful, affecting students' learning processes directly as well. And when we talk about it, inspiration, if we go to the OED, um, is in terms of stimulating, arousing, or encouraging others and often linked with creativity as well. A lot of times students have fed back to me, at least on the consulting side, and is also the living lab, this is a lot of work. I spend way more time doing this, but I, provide, I find it way more valuable. Okay, so it's, and I always say, if you just wanna show up to class, don't do these courses. It takes more work, it takes more effort, but you will get more value. And when we look at innovative teaching then, in terms of innovative teaching is a method that creatively addresses teaching methods and content, and then the emphasis is on successful application of novel ideas. So what we're seeing within, to put it in a business school context, is that we have um, more and more need for alignment with industry needs. If our students don't get jobs when they graduate, they're not gonna be coming to school very long. Honestly, I'd rather have them do philosophy or sociology if they're not getting jobs. I have a BA as well, yay, um, in philosophy. It was, a good, it was a good time. John Scott, James Bradley, awesome professors. Um, so that need to alignment with industry needs, but industry is changing all the time. Um, whether it's in terms of uh, artificial intelligence, whether it's in terms of sustainability, whether in terms of environmental change, demographic change, et cetera, how do we align the skills 
and the knowledge and the theory and the practice that we're having our students do, how do we align that with the industry? That ties into enhancing uh, student employability, but also increasingly in a place like Newfoundland Labrador and elsewhere, how do we encourage an entrepreneurial mindset? So by an entrepreneurial mindset is how do we create the next level of business leaders who are gonna not only just be employees somewhere, but are gonna be leading organizations. And that's important, especially here in Newfoundland Labrador, in terms of how do we create the next levels of not only employees, but business leaders as well. We were getting more and more, as you've probably seen, uh, both from a practice standpoint, and as I'm sure we've been talking around the conference, the importance of diversity and, di and diverse needs, and students learn in different ways. One of the ways that they also, but in the business world, we also need for them to learn is soft skills. And soft skills and being reflective on the soft skills and how they use that in terms of how they present, how they meet people. Do they, um, my uh, millennium kids, or sorry, my pandemic kids, as I like to call them, still don't realize they have to shake people's hands when they go into meetings. Um, they've never had to shake people's hands before, so that's one of the things we've been doing in business for the last three, 400 years. So do you shake hands? When do you shake hands? When do you not shake hands? Um, that's not something we teach in a, in a classroom. Uh, but you know how you actually do it, uh, things from there as well. And then moreover, how do we integrate ethics and sustainability, which is one of the key things I think, moreover, you may, from a critical management perspective, you may say, Tom, well, that's BS, uh, but I would argue that most business leaders these days want to see students with high levels of ethics and integrity who understand sustainability and are willing to engage that and understand that in terms of all the projects and initiatives and leadership that they're trying to demonstrate. So we have a complex world that we're dealing with in business and what we're trying to do is come up with some different innovative ways to try to provide that inspirational, immersive, and, ex and exceptional teaching opportunities. So um, we're gonna go through three case studies now, um, pretty much on time, which I'm surprised at. Um, so the first one we're gonna talk about is about the amazing fund and I'm gonna put that over to my amazing, uh, awesome colleague, uh, Dr. Aaron Olford and my amazing son's basketball coach and student, Russell Noseworthy. Okay, I'll offer you up from there. Aaron, you would like to talk about the fund? Test? Yes. yes. Yes, I would like to talk about the fund. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me, Tom. Um, so, the fund. Okay, we have our own deck, too. Um, so, I'm Aaron Oldford. I, in addition to my role as associate dean, I'm a faculty advisor to the fund. The fund is something that um, I spent a long time, a lot of time growing. Um, but when I joined a, a memorial in 2017, it was that first year that I started working on this project. I saw a gap in the uh, finance curriculum at the School of Business in, in um, in the experiential learning opportunities that we can afford students, and really an opportunity that's afforded to students across Canada at other business schools. So um, I quickly got the support of, of our then dean and started building this program. So I could talk for a full hour, probably longer about it, but I'll give you the nuts and bolts. Um, effectively, this program is it, it lives outside of our formal finance curriculum. There are some course components to it, but what we have is, I mean, really, it's a portfolio management company that exists within the faculty of business, where we hire students to come on to manage a real dollar portfolio of North American, mostly North American equities, so that's stocks. And we used to hold some bonds, but I think we've eliminated that altogether. So we're an equity portfolio where the students hold, you know, they, they buy and sell uh, real dollar uh, positions in companies. Um, and the, the, the purchases, the transactions are informed by ve very deep analysis. So we hire the students. You know, the first year I went to hire students for this program, one of the questions I got was, well, how much do I get paid? And I said, well, my friend, <laughs> and nothing, except experience and network. Um, and so we sort of built over the years uh, a program where students um, can enter the program, you know, straight from high school. We've had a couple students join in their first year of university. Uh, Russell, I think you joined in your second year. 
uh, and now he's entering into his third year, and he'll be the, the lead, one of the leaders of the programs in this coming year. So we've had students stay for three or four years, kind of holding different positions with the program, uh, and Russell can speak a little bit more to how that dynamic benefits the students. But really, I see this program and my role in the program as building the infrastructure to allow the students to learn from each other, but more importantly, to learn from our mentors. So we've established a very impressive, I think impressive list to, you know, and thanks to many people, including Tom, including our, our alumni office, uh, a group of industry mentors who uh, support the students in a number of different ways. So uh, some will attend the, the students' stock pitches and give feedback. Some will do one-on-one -on -one mentoring. Uh, we'll do industry trips to Toronto and those industry mentors will host us. They'll, you know, it's, it's really sort of depends on the industry mentor, but that has embedded the work that we do into, uh, in, into real time and it makes sure that what we do, kind of protecting that downside risk that Tom was alluding to, uh, from becoming irrelevant. It really makes sure everything we do is consistent with what companies on Bay Street, Wall Street are doing day to day. Um, one other thing I'll talk to you before, I'll pass it to Russell so he can speak to the student experience in it, is around Again, protecting that downside. So when we first launched this thing, I had pushback because this was a new idea in the university. And you know, no big surprise, we're a little risk averse in the university. Uh, and so it was like, well, so these students are gonna get a whole bunch of money and they're gonna trade, which sounds really scary, right? <laughs> um, but uh, what we had to do, and I think what we were able to do to help protect um, the reputation of the program, um, and also to secure buy-in was we established an investment charter that was really clear in the roles of the students, the roles of the, of the faculty advisor, setting a very firm governance structure um, that protects, uh, that really clearly communicates what we do and protects from, from that risk. Another thing that we do, and I'm currently engaged in this, is we're continuously improving. So if you looked at the program in year one and you compared it to what we do now, we're much more sophisticated. And even now, I haven't told Russell this yet, but we're looking at adding hedging to our portfolio management <laughs> uh, this year because we're at a certain level of maturity um, and that's we're, we're ready to add that layer of complexity to the program. And I get those insights from industry mentors. They give me very candid feedback all the time. But more importantly, anytime a student graduates from the program, we perform exit interviews. And they're very candid with me on what we can do to improve, because they care deeply about the program. Uh, one last thing is that with, uh, with students going through, we convert them to alumni right away. Even if they're still um, a student with Memorial University, we consider them an alumni of the fund program, and we encourage them to give back right away. So what we've done by doing that is we've, over five years, you can imagine we graduate uh, about, let's say, 10 students every year. We're starting to build this network of alumni who will be out in industry and then support our students going forward. So we have sort of this two layers of, of, of support as students go to enter, enter industry. So I think that kind of summary, I could, like I said, I could talk for a very long time about this program, but why don't, if, if you can add a little color to that. Uh, yeah, no, for sure. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, the, the major thing I'd like to highlight is, is the peer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, so when I started uh, two years ago now, I was an analyst, is what they call it, and there was uh, someone above me, a sector manager, and finally the portfolio manager. So my primary contact was my sector manager, James. It was, uh, it was a very steep learning curve, let's say, but something that uh, was manageable due to the student support, and it would everyone above me had been through this same process, the same learning curve, and had to deal with all the same problems that I'm dealing with. So it, it's one thing when you go into a classroom and in a typical class, you know, everyone's going through the same course material at the same time, at the same point. But with the fund, you have students who, you know, they're your peers outside of the fund, but in the fund, they've, they've gone through this, this process and, and had these same problems, and they're, I guess they're kind of like your boss, but not really, it's not that formal, but they're yeah. there. What, what kind of? Aaron's definitely the boss. 
uh, but they're there to help you and, and it just makes the experience so much more, more valuable. Um, another thing, again, I'd like to highlight is, is uh, again, Erin alluded to, she took all my talking points, but, but then, uh, uh, is the, uh, again, the industry mentors. So it, today, for instance, I was at a meeting with uh, one of our industry mentors, Luke O'Brien, and just out of the blue, sent him an email and there you go. Now, that, you know, the potential for uh, work after, uh, after the degree and, and, um, also feedback again and keeping us relevant uh, so great we're going to do currency hedging now or okay i'll have to learn about that um but uh, just always keeping the program relevant and, and keeping our skills and, and, and our presentations top notch and uh, towards the industry industry standard so overall it's been a great experience and i'm, I'm glad to be a part of continuing the fund and, and helping students learn So the next we'd like to talk about, and we'll do all the Q&A about all the three afterwards, is our living lab. And I pass it over to my amazing colleague, uh, Dr. Jillian Morsey, to talk about our living lab. Jillian. Thank you. Wow, it's loud. Um, so my name is Jillian. I'm really glad to be here to talk about the living lab. Uh, this is basically an elevated version of a traditional case study, which is a common teaching tool used in business schools. Um, so how we've elevated it is by making it an immersive experiential teaching tool and it comes through in two forms. Um, so first of all, we build out uh, what exists as a bright space course shell with the more traditional elements of a case study, all about the, the background of the business, its financials, how it's structured, that sort of thing. Um, and we supplement that with documents. So you, in most of our cases, you would get the full financial documents, recent documents for the organization, um, as well as articles or papers or different things related to the content and how that organization operates. Um, but also we, with CITL, build out video content. So we have interviews with key people, um, key stakeholders and employees in that organization that give their perspective and answer a range of questions that uh, the interviews are built out in consultation with faculty. So the online version of the case is very comprehensive and students have access to that when the Living Lab is incorporated into a particular course. The Living Lab was originally started for the MBA in Social Enterprise and Entrepreneurship and as such, they are focused on uh, social enterprise partners in the province. So the three you uh, uh, see on screen there, um, the, the two top pictures on your right um, are from Choices for Youth, so their thrift shop neighborhood, and then it's just the generic Choices sign. Uh, on the far left there, we have the Colony of Avalon Foundation out in Fairyland, and in the bottom middle, we have the Home Again Furniture Bank, which is the most recent case study uh, living lab we've done. So we have this comprehensive, extensive bright space shell with all the interactive videos, but how that really comes to life is when faculty take it on in their courses. And that's where my team at the Center for Social Enterprise really gets involved uh, in, in making it a living lab. Uh, we help the faculty design the experiential opportunities and we liaise with that community partner to, for example, bring in an executive director to speak to a class and then move through a project with the students. And the projects are designed to be both ben beneficial to student learning, but also beneficial back to that community partner. One thing to know about social enterprises here in the province is many of them are grassroots, small, medium-sized enterprises. They're nonprofits and charities, largely in this province. Um, and they are often under-resourced when it comes to their personnel and their staff. And so having uh, the very knowledgeable students in our graduate and undergraduate programs supporting efforts uh, and initiatives in their operations is incredibly valuable to them. So for example, we've had marketing classes do marketing plans uh, and build out social media uh, uh, plans for, for these social enterprises. We've done all kinds of different projects related to different courses in the core areas of business. Um, and, and Tom has been one of those faculty members who's helped us do that, but we have it across several different courses in our graduate and undergraduate programs. So I think I'll turn it over to Emmanuel to speak about his experience working with the Living Lab and, and that was the Home Again Furniture Bank. Yeah. So thank you. Um, for me, I'll be able to speak about the experience from the student point of view, right? Uh, working with uh, Home and Again on a Living Lab project with the uh, Social Enterprise um, Center. And so um, it came as part of a coursework 
under uh, Professor Tom, we did have the course on ethics and uh, managing responsibility in business. And so uh, working with again and again, we did have the opportunity as a team with some of my other colleagues to work with the business to understand three of their key needs areas. And it was going to give us the experience of working with a local business, trying to understand how we could directly apply knowledge gained from the coursework, which was managing ethics and responsibility with a business that is at the forefront of uh, social responsibility. Uh, because uh, for some perspective, Oman again is uh, a social enterprise that addresses furniture, pass furniture poverty in Newfoundland, it means that there are some people who maybe they've been recently resettled or have suffered adverse financial situations and they can't get um, suitable furniture for beddings, for things like that to sit and they are families but they can't meet their needs in terms of furniture and Oman again distributes this furniture to them for free because they're able to collect donations from other people. And for us, we were going to approach it from a consulting point of view. That's where we as students come up with innovative ways for them to one, show up their revenue. Being a social enterprise, they do not directly generate revenue and it costs money to operate as a social enterprise. At the same time too, in reaching out to more people, since uh, they must be able to attract more furniture donations, they must also be able to you know, contact more people because their reach depends on how well their message is able to go out. So invariably, that was two of the areas we worked on. The third one was on how they could generate uh, funds internally for some of the different projects that they do within the system. So for the team, uh, it was a learning experience. And for Oman, again, it was a rewarding experience because our output was something they could directly plug into their business. Uh, we could work with uh, support at the Center for Social Enterprise. Alisa was the one who directly managed this. And together, we were able to come up with something that still added to the grades we got for you know the coursework because every student wants good grades, right? We did get the grades and it was a good learning experience overall. And it felt better than doing an essay or something that we just you know, crunch the numbers, go uh, online and do hours of research and doesn't translate directly into something uh, with immediate impact. It's still meaningful if you do the online essays and you know all the research, but we still had to do research, go through the course shell that you mentioned was set up on Brightspace. We saw videos, we saw, we got a good introduction into the business, understood uh, from the business part, point of view, and then had the opportunity to visit the business site and meet with their key stakeholder, the person who champions again and again. And altogether, I would say the experience was good, it was rewarding, it translated also into knowing more about uh, the environment, especially for me, who is an international student. I only just arrived to Newfoundland that uh, semester. And besides that, I've subsequently done a follow-up work with Oman again because I had that opportunity. So it's been rewarding on all sides. So I'm done. Thank you. Sure. Great. Um, super. So <laughs> Emmanuel, Emmanuel's a couple of times, it's just when he sees me lecturing, he'll come in and go, go Professor, could I speak? You know, just get up and talk for like 15, 20 minutes about something. So I'm always very conscious of like saying, Emmanuel, you got five minutes, but I'm sure you will come back to Emmanuel if that's okay. Um, but he's awesome. Um, I want to talk a little bit our, about our MBA in undergraduate consulting because when Dr. Kim uh, called me up and said, Dr. Tom, we'd like you to present on this, he said, we, we'd like you to talk about the work we do with SmartIce. Uh, SmartIce, if you don't know, is a um, is a uh, award-winning um, social enterprise that's based in the north that does um, um, basically climate change technology mapping, predominantly using indigenous and Inuit knowledge in terms of developing uh, more safer ways to travel in the north and was founded uh, by Dr. Trevor Bell, uh, who's a retired professor in geography. But um, we had a whole bunch of MBA student consultants working with Trevor uh, under my uh, watchful supervision when we were getting uh, Smart Eye set up, and I was one of the, I was the chair of the of the social enterprise for the first couple of years. So 
our MBA consulting and our undergraduate consulting is really, when you sometimes hear the word consultants, you go, ooh, I want to take a shower. Um, because they always come in and tell you what you want to hear, and they don't always, um, they don't always provide a huge amount of value for the bills. Um, so we've been running uh, our MBA consulting course for probably the last 16 years, and our undergraduate course probably for about the same amount of time. And we've actually, and a lot of these pictures are based out of our Harlow, uh, where we just taught it the last semester, and we've used our students who are going over to Harlow about how do we get them more integrated into the Harlow UK community, and we've been using uh, the consulting from there as well. So traditionally, the way we set up our consulting course, and we this will talk a little bit about the downsize risk, would be real organizations with real problems that need solutions, that need consultants to work with them, and we actually had them pay the students to do that. Now, they, the students didn't get the money, went to the faculty. Um, we've actually eliminated the pay element of it. Not from an equity standpoint, but it was just too difficult to administer from a financial and administrative standpoint. We were like, who do you send the checks to? So like, we got rid of that. And that broadened, actually, once we started doing that, it broadened that up to a whole bunch of social enterprises and not-for-profit organizations who are predominantly our client base now. We will do, um, on the graduate level, uh, we will do pretty much everything from uh, strategic reviews to needs analysis uh, to a, um, sometimes a marketing plan to a whole bunch of different things. Um, Smart Ice is probably the most successful one, I would argue, that we've done. We've killed some dreams along the way as well. Um, Aaron was sitting on the board of an organization where we had to deliver some pretty difficult messages to the organization in terms of what you need to do to go forward. Um, we've worked with some um, small to medium-sized enterprises, which is you know, giving them some really great value that they've been able to access it from there as well. And we've also done work for, um, for example, New Flying Quarterly, uh, a bunch of other organizations in doing those assessments. As uh, Rob Green would like to say, I love these MBA reports. Uh, because if they're useful, I can use them to leverage more funds, and if not, I can ignore them and just say they were students. Um, and that's Rob, but, um, and that's okay, but a lot of people take them very, very seriously. On the undergraduate, very so uh, similar thing. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Blair Windsor, uh, who's not here, uh, who's outside the country at the moment, I would have had him on the panel as well. Um, they, um, he works uh, predominantly with small to medium-sized enterprises around the same sort of thing, but there are undergraduates. The Harlow students um, just completed four projects, which I think I can disclose here. Is, is that okay from disclose? Yeah, they're all on social media, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, two of them, which are local, um, um, a not-for-profit garden organization called the Gibbert Garden, uh, which is a really, really cool garden in, in Harlow, kind of like the botanical gardens, which we've also done work with in the past uh, on steroids. Um, so they were trying to come up with a business model to improve their revenue. Um, they even had problems. We had students looking about how do you get better at parking? Um, just once again, different sort of eyes in terms of looking at it from there. And then on the, um, another project was with uh, a local alum, uh, a former alumni who's now a tech entrepreneur in uh, London and has about three, 350 people working for him. We did a, um, uh, basically a market analysis on a new product for his company. He, he is very, very generous with his time and was able to help the students kind of get some understanding about what was going on. He had them come to conferences to go talk to people, all those sort of things as well. And then the fourth was, um, uh, the fourth was a social enterprise kind of umbrella organization and they needed, to, they wanted to get better at doing uh, online marketing. So we had three accountants and a HR student uh, give them uh, expertise around how they do uh, better. They did an awesome job, given that that wasn't their expertise. Um, so the upside is that, you know, once again, people can get lots of really good information on this and they can get lots of, and they're not, not really paying any money. And the students get huge amounts of um, experience. As one student said to me about a month ago when they walked out of the uh, final presentation on the marketing side, is that I learned more on this course than uh, two marketing courses that I did because I was basically could look at what really worked and what didn't work, uh, which was great for them. The downside is that we always have to be worried about ethics, both in terms of research ethics, et cetera. Uh, I care uh, signs off on this every year. We have to get ethics assessment. We have to do a presentation 
on how to, be, uh, to think about confidentiality, to think about, um, to think about your ethical duties as a student and as a consultant and how you make sure what you disclose and what you do, don't disclose, the importance of the information that you're being given, all those sort of things as well. Um, so there's a lot of controls that we, that we put in place. Uh, and we also do that, I assume, with the fund, and we do that with the Living Lab to talk about the ethics and the importance of that in terms of how we kind of address it from there as well. But in terms of um, employability, we've had a whole bunch of students that have gone on kind of, as in the fund, who are now working in finance or working in consulting. Uh, the head of the, um, the management, uh, the Professional Association for Management Consultants is a former grad of ours now in Atlantic Canada, uh, Radhika. Do you remember Radhika? No, Radhika is cool. Uh, Radhika, and she's, you know, there's a whole bunch of people across the country have the, done MBA consulting. And sometimes they just, once again, it's a really good way to get the soft skills as well, like in terms of when do you shake your hand, uh, when do you not shake hands, how do you do presentations, how do you convince people around to make a good argument to not make a good argument. But that's, um, that's basically our MBA in undergraduate consulting. Um, so we're gonna do a quick discussion for the panel and then we're gonna do an interactive exercise and then we'll go forward from there. So given that the theme is around inspiration and innovation, how do we, how do we think that the programs that we've been involved in, whether they're in terms of the Living Lab or the Fund or the MBA undergraduate consulting, how does that uh, inspire and innovate teaching or experience within the Faculty Business Administration? What do we think? Emmanuel, I'm gonna let you go first because you always like to talk, so <laughs> off you go. I promised to keep it short today. No, right? you don't need to keep it short. You've got to, you got 20, <laughs> but, 10 more minutes. Uh, so I'll say uh, the experience was enriching in that um, we could take a different look at something that, for me personally, I was passionate about. And uh, I could be very much involved from the get go in a new environment. It felt so much uh, different that. I could just get on board on something like a rollover from something I had always wanted to continue doing. And so that was something I really appreciated. And it didn't also feel so classroom-like because it really didn't happen in the classroom. Yes, we had uh, lectures in the classroom, but after a couple of weeks in the lecture, the, the usual course term is about 11 to 13 weeks or thereabouts. So after about four weeks, we then, get, we then started on this. And so what we were learning was something that was continually relevant to the things that we were doing, trying to see from the eye of what was happening in the classroom and moving on to do something for a business that felt this was impactful. They felt this was valued and they valued our time, they valued our efforts. And it wasn't, uh, the final output was clean and tidy. It might not have looked as elaborate as a paid consult consulting gig, but it was relevant to the business and we could connect the, you know, the usefulness with the learning experience from classroom. So that's how I'll put it. Okay. Uh, I would just pick up on that and say, as someone who teaches across, well, faculty of business, but also in the School of Music and, and doing experiential learning in both, um, the opportunity to introduce students to social enterprise. Uh, a lot of people don't know about it or what it is, um, and, and that can be very inspiring and invigorating. And we've had students who then have realized, oh, this is, this is my place, this is where I belong, this intersection of doing well and doing good, um, and using business as a, a force for positive change in society. And so using real life examples and supporting, and, and as Emmanuel said, that immediate impact on an actual social enterprise, which then has um, a spin-off impact on the people that it serves, we are just getting all of this value out of that. You know, there's the value that the social enterprise provides to its beneficiaries, it's the value the students provide to the social enterprise, that additional people power, the expertise or knowledge that the um, employees or the, the people working at the social enterprise might not have, the, the founders. Um, and then the value, learning value for the students and, and trying something new and getting out and seeing maybe a different sector or a different part of the world um, and the way that the world operates that they didn't know before. And that is so very valuable and inspiring and invigorating for, for the teacher as well. Okay, I'll keep mine short because I agree with all of these things. But 
I would just add like how my experience with the fund and also the consulting work has changed how I look at teaching. Um, it really has opened my eyes that like I don't always know what the right thing is to do to teach, right? So it's it's when you're doing when you're involved in projects like this, it's natural to get constant feedback from all your stakeholders, including students. So I regularly get our get students coming to me and saying like, you know, this isn't really working. Let's give this a try, and we give it a try. So it's being a bit humble about us as instructors and saying like, I don't know what always what they need. Sometimes I do, but I don't always know. And so listening and being more agile and building that into the process, I think really is, is part of the magic that creates value for these guys. Um, also, I'm just going to use this opportunity as a plug. This program is available to all students at all levels across the university. So if you have students who might be interested in this program, we recruit every July. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Aaron. You're doing my job for me. Yeah, that, that's good. Yeah, um, yeah just, <laughs> uh, just to build off that and, and talk about the sustainability piece more so, uh, the fund also integrates ESG uh, factors. So ESG is uh, you've got the environmental, the, the social, and the governance factors into, uh, into a selection of the equities which we may end up uh, adding to the portfolio. Uh, so that's a, it's a great lens to look through uh, when we're looking at pitching a company and buying a company. Um, and then uh, obviously just again, the, the learning that we do from peer to peer is, is, is such a major factor. And finally becoming uh, really um, an expert, like you, you have eight weeks to become an expert in the industry uh, of the company that you're gonna pitch. So if we're, let's say we're, we're looking at a telecommunications company and looking to add that to the portfolio, well, you as a student, you, you have a few weeks to understand the whole landscape of that particular sector and the company's position within that sector. And that, that just gives you a great overview. And then maybe next year you're in a different sector, so then you're in energy or you're in healthcare. And then again, you get this background and you become an expert to a degree in that sector, which I think is something you won't get in other courses where it's purely marketing or purely accounting. You're looking at you know how this is applicable in the real world in different sectors. Okay, um, so you may be saying, well, Tom, this is business school. You have lots of money. You, this is why you can do all these cool kind of exercises. But as um, Aaron was saying, it really kind of forces you to really think about how you teach and the ways that you teach, et cetera. So one of the first things I, I, when I started teaching is that I was teaching how to teach business ethics. And business ethics, um, as some people used to say, was an oxymoron. Uh, and now it is more something that's integrated in terms of how we think through from there. But how do you teach business ethics to business students? Do you just get up and say, you should not insider trade, you should not do this or you should not do that? Let me give an example of how you can use immersive and inspirational learning in terms of teaching something that intuitively shouldn't work from there as well. This is a scenario, it's called truth versus loyalty. And what I'd like you to do if we, yeah, we turn around to people, we've got a couple minutes and just turn around to the person behind you and ask what would you do in this situation. Jane is a senior human resources professional within your company. She has just been told in strict confidence that there'll be some layoffs due to restructuring and a change in funding from the provincial and federal governments. Given the location of the service provided by your company, the opportunities for new employment for the five employees concerned are zero. Jane's best friend went to Helen works in this unit. Helen is a single mother with a two-year-old daughter and is the administrator for the department. Jane and Helen trust each other completely when it comes to sharing confidence, confidences. Helen had phoned early, uh, Jane earlier to say that she was planning to complete the purchase of a new and larger house that afternoon. Your company is not yet in a position, nor is it legally obliged to make any official announcement on job losses. I'd like you to turn around to the person uh, sitting next to you and talk very quickly around three questions that we normally leave people 20 minutes to discuss, but you're gonna do it in two, uh, which is what would most people do and why? How does it relate to ethics and how does it relate to business ethics? And what would be the right thing to do and why? Off you go, two minutes. Okay, 10, nine, eight, seven, six, Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay. Welcome back, everyone. So, um, 
what would more, and so Erin, when I said, what do you think? She goes, oh, it's ethics, it really depends, right? Uh, you know, or you take a, annual leave, you know, like around when it's going on. Um, <laughs> but what would, what would most people do and why? What would most people do? Spill yes, Ken. They're going to spill the beans. Okay, hands up. How many people would tell their friend, you're about to get laid off? Okay. How many people would not tell their friend that they're going to get laid off? Okay, one, two, three, four. Paul, you did this in your MBA. You should remember. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Okay, cool. Okay. How many people, I've had people who are lawyers go, you know, I can make a call. I could have this like tied up in probate court for the next couple of months. There's no way. Don't worry about it. But yeah, or kind of hint like, it's not really a great time to be buying on the market or, you know, blah, blah, blah. Or you can go, have you used, you know, you should get a better real estate agent like Jillian's father, who's the awesome Bill Shepard. You know, like, there you go. Um, so um, when, I, when I say, when I do this to my undergraduate students, uh, how many of them say that they would tell their friends? 100%. I love my friends. It's my friends. I can't, I got to tell my friends. Then when I do it for my graduate students, how many of them are telling? It's not as many. It's probably around 60, 70%. And then when I get to executives, you know, like how many of them say they would tell? It's actually going up because people are going, I don't really care about my job anymore <laughs> post pandemic. I'll get another job. I'd rather disclose. Okay. So how does this relate to ethics then? Any philosophers in the room? How does it relate to ethics? Okay. I can lie then. So it doesn't matter. I see, and this is where, and so this is where the discussion starts. So what do we mean on this, et cetera? And I, given the time, we'll talk about it afterwards. But so when you look at it from a, a duty and an obligation, so the key word of this is your senior human resources professional. When you're a professional, you sign up to a code of conduct. You sign up to say, I will not disclose, I will have confidentiality, just like you're an engineer or something. You sign up to a very specific code of conduct. That code of conduct if we, it's very much based on a deontological in terms of a duty-based obligation that you have a professional, bringing in the wider notion of ethics, right? So if that duty and obligation that you have is going to be uh, overcome by your own personal kind of self-interest in terms of, I love my friends, my friends, you can say, well, maybe there's a wider utility, kind of a utilitarian perspective in terms of what's going on. And then you can also say, but look, she's an employee. She's, she has an agency issue or agency problem for all this sort of thing in terms of how you engage with it. So suddenly we brought in four or five major kind of theories, both from philosophy and kind of organizational studies around, should I tell my friend or not tell my friend? So when we look at it in terms of what would be the right thing to do and why, this is where kind of putting ourselves in kind of that situation, just like we put people into the fund and put them into consulting or put them into a living lab, it's about putting them in, them in the place it's putting them in the situation, is allow them to apply the skills and the theory and the models and really kind of make it relevant and make it almost sing for them in terms of how they look at the world and how they look at what they're learning as well. So thank you very much. I'm very happy to answer any questions and the panel is happy to answer any questions. I'm just conscious of time because I've got it right to the limit and so, um, but if there's any questions, Nobody ever asked questions in business school presentations like this in months, <laughs> so it's all good. So we all good? No questions? Thank you so much, everyone. I hope you enjoyed tomorrow as well. Um, and it's a pleasure being here uh, presenting. Thank you. Thank you to the panel. Great job.